it goes to the sr actually uh, dr sidhi i don't know whether you are aware this has been going on for the last about two weeks in india uh, the the pediatric cardiology forum is conducting a series of webinars yes and this uh, last three days we are so fortunate to have uh, people uh, luminaries like you uh, into our uh, meeting uh, we had dr zahid amin two days ago and dr chetan yesterday and we are so fortunate to have uh, an extremely accomplished person like you for our mm -hmm. meeting today we look forward to hear from you about the percutaneous pulmonary valve implantations Great. and then share a small experience that we have gained in our country after your uh, detailed lecture good thank you thank you uh, shiva kumar so first of all uh, i want to thank ustri uh, as well as satya for uh, getting in touch with me and making everything possible they contacted me over a week ago and uh, i love the idea because now this is the only way i wish the only wish that i have going forward these meetings we're going to need to start providing cmes because you know you sit you listen you watch so why don't you claim cme because now there are no cmes being provided so i think this is uh, good so because uh, the topic is very big i divided my talk into two parts we'll give today part one and then hopefully the next uh, meeting will give part two so let me just share the uh, screen with you Okay, let me see. Do you see the uh, slides? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we are able to see. If you go on full screen, then we'll see. It. Yes, full screen. You see it? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so. Uh, you know, this is a, a picture we took a few weeks back. You know, that was my last trip, Barat, yeah, outside yeah. Qatar. Since I came back, thank God they did not quarantine me. And obviously, thank God I don't have corona. But that was the last meeting that I attended, uh, you know, worldwide. This is my uh, disclosure slide. We're not going to talk about even the Venus So we're going to discuss the topic of pulmonary valve replacement. And obviously... Uh, the pulmonary valve is being uh, done, replacement is being done for a couple of major conditions, pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary regurgitation. Uh, pulmonary stenosis, we all know about it. Let me just talk briefly about the physiology of pulmonary regurgitation. When you evaluate patients, you need to look at the size of the regurgitant uh, orifice. You need to evaluate the pulmonary artery anatomy. You need to evaluate the pulmonary vascular resistance and you need to evaluate the right ventricle compliance as well as the left ventricle ejection fraction. Now, if you ask patients with PR about symptoms, as probably you know, the majority would say, oh, I have no symptoms. So they're mostly asymptomatic. However, if you challenge them, or if you do a, an objective test like uh, CPEX, uh, you know, cardiopulmonary uh, uh, exercise, exercise testing, the majority of them, they will have limitations. They have diminished exercise tolerance, and they may have right and left ventricle failure, and they may have increased risk of arrhythmias, which may lead to syncope, as well as we all know, 6% of patients with cardiac failure, they may have sudden death. So how do you assess pulmonary regurgitation? Obviously, the easiest thing is physical exam, but we know that physical exam does not get you much to say, well, yeah, this is severe, mild, or moderate, whatever. So you uh, prominent parasternal heave, single S2, diastolic crescendo murmur, systolic ejection murmur, and signs of right-sided congestive heart failure. And if there is a PFO, some of these patients may have cyanosis. Then you go to an EKG. The EKG, again, non-sensitive and not specific test. They may have RVH, they may have STT wave changes, complete right bundle branch block in majority of patients who had surgery for histology below. And an important uh, parameter is the QRS duration. And actually this has prognostic uh, uh, value because if your QRS duration is over 180 milliseconds, then these patients are at risk of ventricular tachyarrhythmias and sudden death. After the EKG, you move to echocardiography. Again, the echocardiography is basically the gold standard test because it's readily available in almost all cardiac centers and in almost all areas of the world. 
but it's a quite challenging to assess the degree of PR. But we look at certain things. Ratio of the width of the regurgitated jet color flow to the annulus. If it's more than 60, 70%, then that is a severe PR. Then you look at holodiastolic retrograde flow in the distal pulmonary artery. Doppler estimates of regurgitant fraction, RV ejection fraction, RV volume. The RV volume by echo is not very accurate. But if you do it on the same patient, the same views by the same operator, then you may use it for follow-up. LV function, you can assess an estimation of the RV pressure, again, from uh, you know, the TR jet and PR jet, and localization of the uh, obstruction, if there is obstruction in the arto tract or the branch PAs. And of course, you can do Doppler tissue images. And these are some images here. You can see this uh, short axis view. You can see wide open PR. This is a view of the uh, tricuspid valve and looking at the right ventricle. You can see how big is the right ventricle. You can estimate the size. By Doppler, you can see here in this patient, the retrograde flow is actually slightly more than the anterograde flow indicating severe PR. And one thing which is an important uh, uh, parameter is uh, uh, an M mode, uh, systole, diastole, and you look at the ratio, and if it's more than 1.8 to 1, then basically uh, that's significant PR. And again, the RV volume by echo, if it's done by the same operator, same view, you may use it for uh, a serial follow-up of the patients. After echo, CT scan is important, and CT scan gives you information, of course, much more than echo, but it does not give you hemodynamic data. That's the only uh, bad side of CT scan, but it can look at the coronary arteries. It can look at the RV of the tract. It looks at the branch PAs, whether there's obstruction or anything, and it's a good uh, tool to do 3D uh, print out of the uh, RV of the tract to decide what uh, value you want to use. And then finally, uh, or before, the one before finally is cardiac MRI, which is the gold standard to uh, assess RV in diastolic volume, RV ejection fraction, pulmonary ejection fraction, LV ejection fraction, and all of this. Now, the RV in diastolic volume is an important parameter, and the new guidelines that came out last year by the American uh, Heart Association and uh, the ACC and the SCI, they looked at an indexed volume minimum if the patient is asymptomatic of more than 160 ml per meter square. And that's an important one. Finally, you take the patient to the cath lab. Usually, I would only take them to the cath lab for a couple of things. If they have an associated lesion that you want to evaluate and intervene on, and second, if you want to do balloon sizing of the arbitrary tract so that you will know exactly what size valve, because we all know these valves are not on the shelves. So you need to tell the company, oh, bring me a 22 millimeter or 23 millimeter or 26 millimeter valve. So that's an important thing uh, with the cardiac cath. And then of course, you can look at uh, if there's uh, uh, intercardiac shunting and all of these things. So the cath lab is important. This is basically looking at the traces in the MPA in the blue color, showing that very low diastolic pressure indicating severe PR. So now you assess the patient and you think that your patient needs a valve. Traditionally, we send them to the OR, to the surgeon, and then the surgeon basically has one of a few things that can help the patient. Either a homograph, which is this one here on the left-hand side, or a, a cloth tube with a valve sewn inside, or on the right-hand side is the contagra, which is the bovine jugular vein. All of these, their mode of failure is basically stenosis, but sometimes it's stenosis and regurgitation. It is rare that the surgeons will use a prosthetic valve on the right side of the circulation because of uh, the risk of thrombosis. Now, all of these things, especially homographs, we know how lousy they are. If you look at this graph from Circulation 2000, Jim Twiddle, a cardiac surgeon now is in Cincinnati, took his first 100 homographs and looked and if you look at between four to six years, you know, five years, in black, 74% of the patients already had what we call re-intervention on their homograph. And in red, 47%, they met the definition of dysfunctional homograph after four and a half years. 
So we know that despite the fact that we say, oh, the homo graft is going to last you 20 years, they really don't. In very few patients, of course, the older they are, the uh, longer these homo graft last. But if they are younger kids, they don't last long. These are the indications uh, published in 2006. Uh, uh, at that time, they were talking about a volume of 150 ml. Now, as I said, it's 160. Ejection fraction of the right ventricle less than 40%. Regurgitative fraction, you know, PR more than 35%, and added to that is the QRS duration. Who are the patients? This slide divides the patients into two groups. The one on the right hand side of the slide are the patients who receive a conduit, and on the left hand side, the patients who receive a transannular patch. And obviously, those on the left hand side of the slide represent the majority of the patients. Now, technical considerations. So now you decided this patient needs a percutaneous valve. You need to prepare yourself and your team uh, as to we need to conduct this. So you need to know the devices that are available. We talked about pre-selection. We will assess that later. Baseline assessment. What are the equipment needed in the cath lab and the steps in the cath lab? And then give you an example and go from there. I know that I'm talking fast because I have a lot of material to uh, cover. So we have two commercially approved valves have FDA approval. There is a third valve that is approved by CE, European Community, which is the my valve from India, but it does not have a specific indication for pulmonary valve, but we have used it off label in the pulmonic position. The Edwards valve, the stint is cobalt chromium. It's available in sizes from 20 to 29 millimeter in a three millimeters increment and the sheath is anywhere from 16 to 21 French. The other valve is the melody, which is the bovine jugular vein sewn inside a platinum iridium stint, the CP stint, cheerum platinum stint. The valve is available in now actually three sizes, uh, 18, 20, 22 millimeter, but actually they added a 16 millimeter recently to, to this after the extensive testing that 16 millimeter should function well. This is an X-ray showing that it is very radio opaque. This is the bib balloon, balloon and balloon delivery system, which is, uh, gives you a precise delivery uh, of the valve. The Melody valve, actually, this coming September will be the 20th year anniversary of the first patient done by Philippe Bonhoeffer when he was in Paris. Actually, his first case was in Paris, not in London. And then in 2006, received CE approval. In 2007, the first US implant. In 2010, received HDE, special status approval in the US. And in 2015, full approval in the US. And again, this is basically showing you the, this is an older slide from 2016, showing you the majority of cases, of course, in the US because they can pay. The rest of the world, including Europe, these valves are expensive, so the use is less than the United States. But there's more and more uh, cases being done everywhere else due to the fact that it does save the patient uh, major uh, cardiac surgery. Medtronic has done very good uh, job approving the valve and doing a lot of studies in the US, in Europe, and outside German, Italy, Canadian, French to follow patients who receive the valve. The majority of the patients, 45% of them had tetralogy of fellow or tetralogy of fellow on pulmonary treason with a conduit, of course. And 14% uh, they had previous rust procedure, uh, transposition, and truncus arteriosus. So these are the kind of patients they had. So to summarize, the melody valve, its uh, successful implant is very high. Procedural adverse events is low at 6%. Uh, the valve competence is maintained now for over. 10 years uh, with good results. And the stent fracture was the major Achilles heel in this valve. And because of that, the recommendation by the manufacturer is before you implant the melody valve, you need to implant a landing zone, a stent, to prevent stent fracture. Unlike the Edwards valve, we implant a landing zone as a landing zone, not to prevent stent fracture. With the melody, is basically to do it for a stent fracture. How do you pre-select the patient? Again, patients have to have a conduit or a bioprosthetic valve. 
of certain or known diameter. The weight has to be about 35 kilo, but quite honestly, I've done it as small as a 12 and a half kilo. But the recommendation 35 kilo because the melody takes 22 French, the Edwards, uh, the, uh, the new Edwards takes 16 French to 18 French. No infection for the preceding six months, and we will discuss the endocarditis issue. And of course, the femoral veins have to be patent, but you can go from the jugular without any problem. Actually, jugular delivery, in my opinion, is better than femoral delivery. And again, you can implant it in transannular patch cases as long as you put a landing zone, i.e. like a conduit. There are certain things that you need to do, you know, the physical exam, the history, the current medications, classify the New York heart classification status, and then you do x-rays, blood testing, urine testing, EKG, chest x-ray, angina, and all what we have mentioned. Equipment. You need a lot of equipment in the cath lab. First of all, it's better to do it in a biplane lab, but not a must, but you can do it in a monoplane. Then I prefer general endotracheal anesthesia so that if you run into complication, the last thing that you need to worry about is the airway. So let the anesthesiologist intubate them and you don't have to worry about that. Then I like to use either the pair clause or the figure of eight. If the patient does, cannot afford the pair clause, you can do figure of eight, it's cheap. Then you need, you know, super stiff wire. We use the Lundberg Quist or the Meyer wire. And you need multi-track catheters. You need the balloons for sizing. You need high pressure balloons to open up the RV of the track. And I prefer the Atlas balloons because they are non-compliant, but you can use the Zemit, you can use the uh, Opta, you can use whatever balloon you like and uh, go from there. You need to have available to you different types of stents that you can deploy to a large size. So the large size is basically the P, the Palmas series, P3110 or P4010, EV3, you know, Max LD or uh, uh, the, the Max LD stent uh, in this case. The Mega is not as good because it does not support you well, but the Max is better than the Mega. CP is okay. And to be honest with you, my favorite now is the Andra stent. Andra and Bentley stents are really good. You need to have in your lab covered stents. And I will not forgive somebody if they dissect the RDOT and you lose the patient because you don't have covered stents in your cat lab. If you don't have covered stents, in my opinion, you should not get engaged in this business. Because again, if you dissect or rupture, you've got to have covered stents. There are the CP, the Bentley, uh, the B, you know, which is the B graft or from the Tronic, uh, or from Gore, whatever stentographs you have available. TEE and ICE, optional. It does not really add much aside from assessment of the PR if you want, because you don't have to have a wire across the uh, valve, and you have to have a snares just in case you embolize something. So general anesthesia, vascular access, you start with eight French in the femoral vein, and if you want to use the pair closure, you can do it, or the uh, figure of uh, eight at the end. Full hemodynamic study. Make sure that you assess everything, no distal obstruction. Then I position my supra stiff wire in the distal LPA because the trajectory is better than the RPA. But in some cases, the LPA did not work. We had to do from the RPA. But in general, LPA is better. Then uh, this is a, a crucial step, selective coronary angiography while you have balloon inflation to the almost final diameter of the valve, because if you inflate a stent in the RVOT and the, st and the stent is close to the coronaries, in five to 6%, you will end with disaster. So this step is mandatory unless if by coronary angiography, the distance is so far, then you don't have to do balloon inflation and all of that. But if the distance is close, then you have to verify that. And on rare occasion, actually, if, if you cannot decide, I do intravascular I, you know, uh, IVAS uh, for the coronary artery while I inflate the balloon. And it's important when you do coronary angiography, you do it in different views because one view may show you the left main and the LED, they're looking good. You change the view and there is significant narrowing. And that happened to me, and that's why I assess everything without any problem. 
So example, when you do selective like this, you can see that it's far from the alveolar tract. So this is a patient with calcified homograft, right? It looks uh, good for uh, a van. Then you need to uh, put your uh, landing zone. Again, with a stent implantation, you have the bib balloon, which is good because the bib balloon decreased the incidence of balloon rupture during stent implantation. And the positioning is more accurate than if you do it with single balloon. But have we done it with single balloons? Of course, we've done most of our lives with single balloon. So that's important. There is the stent here uh, being uh, positioned, so we're gonna bring it back to the calcification area. And you know, the important thing to take your time and do because these patients are rock stable. There's no need to uh, hurry. There is no need for rapid RV pacing in the right side, but on rare occasion when PR is really bad and the catheter is jumping back and forth, you may need to do pacing. But in general, none. You saw here in this patient the balloon rupture, so we, we change the balloon and we, we repeat until we open up the area close to the final diameter that we want. If the thin diameter is less than 21 millimeter, I use the high pressure balloons. In this case, Atlas balloons because they're non-compliant to open up to the diameter I am uh, you know, shooting for. So in this case, we use the Mullins uh, balloon, but even sometimes the, the Mullins balloons, they rupture and they are semi-compliant, but they are good balloons as well. And then after you finish all of this, then you want to bring your valve over the super stiff wire to do that. In this case, I had to put two wires to uh, facilitate passage of the uh, balloon and to prevent, uh, you know, in this case, I needed to use two balloons to open up this, the, the stent because I could not open it as much as I want. But finally, we were able to open up the, the stent. Again, if the stent diameter becomes acceptable, then you can choose a valve close to that stent size. In this case, this is the Edwards valve being crimped. This is the crimper, you're all familiar with that over the balloon or over the shaft, depending on what type of valve. Because remember, the old sapien valve, you need to crimp on the balloon. And that's why it required large sheath. The new sapien XT and S3 and the my valve, their profile is much lower because you crimp the, uh, the valve on the shaft, except the my valve, actually you, you crimp it on the balloon. Uh, so this is, these are just the steps. You dilate the, the femoral veins. These are dilators. And, you know, it's, it's a large delivery system. And, you know, when you have a landing zone, you know exactly where to position the van. So, for example, this is, we know there's the van. We put the wire, in this case, in the RPA because it was easier in this case. And you want to get there. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's difficult, and that's where the scary thing with the Edwards valve, because if you, do not, if you cannot get to where you want, basically, you're in big trouble. Uh, you cannot remove the valve from the body, and that's where the advantage of the my valve, if you cannot get there, you can get it outside the sheath without any problem, but not the Edwards valve. But yes, the melody valve, the melody valve because it's covered. And then finally, you do a, 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 an angiogram to assist the PR and go from there. Then you repeat your hemodynamics, and uh, if the gradient is more than 15, then you use another high pressure balloon to open up the valve to reduce the gradient to less than 15. Because if the gradient is more than 15, when these patients wake up, it's high. So I don't like to do that. And if you use ice or TEE, you can assess the final regurgitation. But as I said earlier, it's not a must step in the cath lab. And this is uh, basically looking at the coronary arteries after the um, uh, injection, you can see it's far and no uh, compromise. And then this is ice in this patient home view. And then this is trivial TR. And then you assess there is your uh, valve before the, uh, uh, before the uh, uh, valve with the gradient. And then if I scroll here for the interest of time after we put the valve, you can see the valve looks very nice, trivial PR, and the gradient is less. So here is a couple of perfect cases. This is a patient, again, homograft, calcified. You can see it there. And then if I scroll in the interest of time, so we put a landing zone. This is the P410. Uh, prepare it, do it well, and then we put the valve 
right in the middle of the stint, you open it up nicely, and then the final result looks very good. And you can see there's ice catheter, and there's the angiogram, it looks very good with no problems. This is another case, there's severe PR in this patient. And if we scroll in the interest of time, balloon sizing, coronary angiography, it looks good, and there's the landing zone, then there's the melody valve being put there, open it up, and then the final result looks very good. So really, these, these procedures, they make you feel great at the end because you put a valve in the patient and the patient goes home the next day. Potential complications, important, homograft rupture. Fortunately, this is rare, but it does happen. That's why you have to have covered stents. Migration of the valve, distal or proximal, that's bad. You cannot do much about it. You may able to position it in the IVC or the SVC, wherever you can, and then use a new valve. Balloon rupture, uh, it's bad if it is circumferential. If it's longitudinal, you can get it out easily. But if it's circumferential, unfortunately, uh, extraction of the segment is a little bit more difficult. I know I exceeded the time, let me just... So conclusion, percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation is a straightforward procedure in an equipped lab with good expertise uh, uh, in stenting RVOT branch PAs. Attention to minor detail is uh, crucial for the success of the procedure. Complications can occur and be prepared to handle availability of every gizmo in the cath lab. And thank you for your attention, and we hope we will see you in Boston, if not virtually. So I'm trying to uh, exit. Thanks, uh, Z, for giving us the step by step uh, uh, demonstration of uh, percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation. Thank you. Now, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things, as far as the indications are concerned, if it is a purely regurgitant lesion, obviously there are definite parameters. Uh, if it is purely stenotic lesion, obviously, you know, more than three fourths or two thirds of the system. But many of the conduit dysfunction have combined lesions. Correct. You know, they have stenosis it's as it's well different. as regurgitation. So do you have any different strategies for dealing with these mixed lesions as far as the, the indication for percutaneous pulmonary? Yeah. Pulmonary? So the mixed lesions, I primarily assess the stenosis. How much? Because the regurgitation, many of them, the regurgitation is not severe and the RV volume is not uh, large. So I look at the stenosis part of the mixed legion. And if the gradient is more than 40 millimeter mercury with some PR, I say, you know what, this patient requires. And again, it depends on the size of the patient and the financial status of the patient and what I want to do. If the patient is large size, and if they can afford this, I'd say, you know what, I can put a big size valve here, no problem. But if the patient, uh, you know, financially is constrained and uh, uh, they are small, I like to wait longer so that until I really have very solid indication to intervene. Because remember, this procedure, although it's simple, but complications can be fatal and you want to be able to defend yourself in the court of law if something goes bad, that's all. Uh, Z, I'm Dr. Mutu, I'm from Chennai. Yes. Uh, I have a quick question. I got a 40, a 50 year old lady who's a tetology had a post operative. She's got about a 40 grain across the primary valve and she also got free PR. I did a balloon sizing for her on the valve. There's a mild waste on a 25 mm balloon when they expanded. There is no coronary anomalies. Um, would you consider uh, uh, putting a straight away uh, my valve there without pre stenting or not? Because to take a stent across there, you need a big, huge sheath, which is not available yeah. in India. So, yeah. what are the suggestions here? In, in these patients, you know what? First of all, this patient needs a valve. She meets the criteria, especially adults. Any gradient over 30, 35, they really don't do very well. And the my valve, the height of it is almost 20 millimeter. 18 to 20 millimeter. If there is a stenotic area there, I would not hesitate on in putting the valve without pre stenting. However, if the waist is question mark, your best bet is to start with the pre stenting because if the stent does not stay there, then it is cheaper than putting a valve that does not stay there. Okay, right. Okay. That's how I look at it. So, would you consider a hybrid procedure here because you know she's considering her age? Uh, what is your uh, experience with hybrid procedures? We've done, you know, hybrid and Damien published on this. I personally 
believe if the patient has great vascular access and good landing zone, I would not worry about that. I would go with percutaneous. However, if it is a question mark, I would not even hesitate using the hybrid. Right? What is the access you use for hybrid in your center? Do you uh... small subcostal incision? All right, okay. subcostal incision. And then yeah, you... there is. Yes. There are some questions from the audience. Yes. The first question is that if you have a biological prosthesis in the pulmonary position, can you do a percutaneous pulmonary valve implant? The answer is yes. If the bioprosthesis is larger, in my opinion, larger than 21 millimeter, because the 21 millimeter, the effective diameter is about 19, 18 and a half, 19. And if you put a valve, then your effective orifice will be about 16 and a half, 17. And I can tell you, maybe under anesthesia, the gradient is low, but when they wake up, they will have more gradient. That's number one. Number two, some of the valves you can fracture so that you can put larger valve. But the fracture, you need to use the hypershare balloon, the atlas, and maybe you can buy one to two millimeter, not, not more than that. Uh, the second question is that, uh, do you do stenting in one procedure and uh, put the valve later on or in the same procedure? Probably you will have to differentiate between a conduit and a, a native RBO. Actually, I've done it both. Again, if I take these patients to the cath lab to prepare them and I find that they are eligible, I pre-stent them there, then I order the valve. Because as again, these valves are not on the shelf and you need to bring the clinical specialist and all of this. So you need to make sure, tell them, hey guys, I need this size valve because I did balloon sizing. If you don't do balloon sizing, then you have to order different valves and all of that. So that's the advantage. I usually do two-stop shopping, but I've done on occasions when I have valves on the shelf, one-stop shopping. You put the stint and you proceed. Obviously, you've got to be very careful here, dislodging your stint that you just put. And that's why some operators say, you know what, I don't want to worry about this. I'm going to pre it now, wait for four to six weeks or longer, and then bring them back. Uh, Zia, there is one argument of pre stenting and then coming back that some of these patients, despite having a free PR, tend to get symptomatically worse after you uh, after you put this stent, do you really uh, support this argument, or you think that? Uh... I, I don't think so. I've left actually. You know, we used to pre-stent the RVOT for everybody and wait months, if not a year to two years, until they get a valve. Uh, you may have that unique patient. Don't wait too long for them. But there are occasions. You know, I mean, many times they don't have increased symptoms at all. See, on the contrary, I would like I would say that the pre-stenting actually makes the patients better. Very often they'll be having an RV pressure of 100, 110, and they after the pre-stenting they come back with much lower RV pressures. In fact, they symptomatically became better. Shiva, yeah. Shiva, this is in patients who have free PR, okay. and you want to pre-stent and come back for okay. the stent not to move in the same procedure. Okay. Of course, if there is stenosis, obviously after stenting, they would definitely get better. I agree with you. This is for pre free PR because of the concerns of the valve not being or the stent not being stable when you are trying to implant the valve. And uh, one more question is uh, regarding how many patients or how often you had to reject a patient because of uh, coronary issues in your experience. In my experience, I only had two patients that were the definitely the coronary artery got smaller and smaller and I proved that by IVAS. Uh, and this is out of, uh, in Chicago uh, and here over about maybe almost 150 cases uh, of pulmonary valves. So it's not common, but the paper that was published by uh, Duff McElhinney, it was about almost 6%. And the issue is even if it is uncommon, the complication can be so dreadful that uh, you have to uh, interrogate in every patient, uh, no matter what the incidence. That is a no excuse that you say, oh, I think it's going to be okay That's without right. proper assessment and you lose the patient. Again, no lawyer will defend you. Okay, uh, Ziad, in the interest of time, I think uh, we'll keep other questions uh, at yes. the end of the uh, session. Perfect. Perfect. Okay.
Dr. Bharat, I think uh, you, you have to give the next talk on an Indian perspective. And while you are getting your slides loaded, can I just ask one question which I feel is relevant? Sure. What is your anticoagulation or antiplatelet strategy following a percutaneous pulmonary valve, Dr. Z? Uh, you will have to unmute Ziad. Satya, you will have to unmute Ziad. Ziad is muted. Dr. Z, can you hear us? I yeah. can hear you. Yes, can now he's unmuted. Yeah. So yes. my anticoagulation regimen is basically intraoperatively, I use heparin, and I usually don't give the full dose, 100 units per kilo. I usually start with 50, check my ACT, make sure that it's over 200 seconds. Then, after the procedure, I put them on aspirin for one year. And actually, I recommend for my patients to stay on aspirin indefinitely, but many of them, after one year, they say, you know what, they stop, and I have no problem with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, good evening friends. I'm going to speak on percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation, an Indian perspective. So Ziad, big minds think alike. I also thought that I should share some of these good memories. Who thought at that time that we would be locked down and would not be able to see each other for so many days. It was a great uh, meeting in Delhi during India Live when we had some good time together. So before I start, I have to acknowledge uh, my proctor, uh, Dr. Stefan Schubert from Berlin Heart Institute. And this is our team, uh, my colleague, Dr. Maulik, our surgeon, Dr. Shiva Prakash, who is an, uh, a phenomenal guy and who really has supported this program wholeheartedly, our anesthetist. And of course, uh, our owners, uh, the owners of the hospital, without whose financial help, this program would have been an impossibility. So as all of you know, this program of percutaneous pulmonary valve started around 2014 in India. Of course, it took many years and the reason was obvious, the economics. Venus P valve was probably the first valve to enter the Indian market, followed by Melody, My Valve, and off late Sapien. Now, these are the institutes and these are the number of cases done in India. It is possible that I have overlooked some of the operators or some of the institutions, but it is not intentional, it is just by oversight. The uh, Amrita Institute has done three all venous P valves with native RBOT. Muttu Kumar at Apollo has done three all my valve. He has done my valve in other positions like mitral and tricuspid, but that is not the, uh, that is not the point of discussion this evening. Uh, at Fortis, uh, they have done three melody valves. At Frontier Lifeline Kochi, one melody. At MMM, as you know, Shiva has the maximum experience in the country. He has done 28 valves, which included six Venus P straight, around 16 with flares, 11 he has done in MMM, and five outside MMM as Proctor. And then he has experience with Melody, Sapien 3, and My Valve. Narayan Rudayale has done one melody, we at Reliance have done six melodies, and then Jaydeva one my valve, and Nageshwar has done one Venus P valve. Now this is the summary of our patients. Uh, we have done six patients, as I said, with age ranging from 16 to 76 years. There were three females and three males. Most of them were in class two to three, excepting the last 76 years old lady was in class four. Most of them have had a two to three procedures, either surgeries or transcatheter interventions. As far as conduit dysfunction is concerned, most of them had mixed lesions, predominantly pulmonary stenosis, but almost all of them had free pulmonary regurgitation. The right ventricular pressure was systemic in five out of six, and one of them had a suprasystemic PA pressure. All of them had a 22 millimeter melody mounted on 20 ensemble in four and 22 ensemble in two. I'm going to just present a couple of cases because I thought that they were interesting, and that's why uh, I'll just share with you a couple of our patients. First is a truncus arteriosus who was repaired with an interposition uh, 15 millimeter aortic homograft in 2000. 
and then had a redo conduit replacement with a 20 millimeter bovine pericardial conduit and a Gore-Tex membrane leaflets in 2008. Had a balloon dilatation of branch PAs with a failed attempt at stenting the RVOT because the sheath could not go across the conduit. And uh, this patient came in uh, NYHA class two to three. You can see that he has a very severe pulmonary stenosis with a peak systolic gradient of 115 and a free pulmonary regurgitation. Now look at this uh, CT scan very carefully. You can see that this is a 11 or 12 year old conduit, severely calcific. And if you see the extent of calcification, it is just underneath the branches of the pulmonary arteries. The stenosis of the conduit at its uh, most severe portion is eccentric with 15 millimeters in one dimension and only nine millimeters in the other. If you look at the pulmonary arteries, there is a mild pulmonary artery stenosis bilaterally. This is a three-dimensional reconstruction. And if you look at the size of the left and the right pulmonary arteries, it is around 7.6 and 8.8 .8 millimeter respectively. I think the most important thing is the extent of calcification. And you never know which part of calcific homograph will give way. So you have to treat them with equal respect no matter, you can't say that I will leave alone this particular calcium because it's unlikely to rupture. You never know which part of calcium would rupture. So we took this patient in the lab. This is the baseline aorta with left pulmonary artery. This is a pullback from left pulmonary artery into the main pulmonary artery, gradient of around 35 to 40 millimeters. This is a pullback from right pulmonary artery to main pulmonary artery. Again, the gradient is around 35 to 40. And this is from main pulmonary artery to the right ventricle. Again, the gradient is around 40 to 45. As you see here, the right ventricular pressure is systemic. Now, uh, it is very important that when you have a calcific conduit, how are you going to interrogate the conduit with respect to coronary arteries? So first and foremost, what we do is just uh, take a coronary shoot. And here you can see that coronary is far away from the conduit. But remember one thing, what appears far away may not be all that far away because what you are seeing is the lumen of the conduit and not the wall. And second thing is the calcium in the conduit is known to migrate and pinch on the coronary. So you have to be very, very careful interrogating these conduits. And this is, the, uh, this is the PA projection where you feel that it's an anteroposterior uh, disposition of the coronary with respect to conduit, but you can see that the uh, coronary is far too away. Now, what we do in a case like this is we don't interrogate the coronary with a balloon. We will interrogate only after we put in a covered stent. And this is what I have learned from my proctor. Different people do it differently. In this particular patient, uh, we put the uh, wire and uh, initially we started with Lundquist, but since it did not give us an adequate support, we switched over to what is called as an e-wire, which is available in Europe, not so commonly available anywhere else. So this was a left pulmonary artery wire, and then we wanted to get our sheath to put in a covered stent. And this is what happens. And this is what happened to us even the previous time when we failed to put the stent into the conduit. So this was so difficult to get the big sheath across this calcific conduit and it's not uncommon. So I think one of the principles is rather than having the wire into the anterior part, it is better to have it not only inferiorly but also posteriorly. And the second trick that we used is we took, away, took out the dilator and got the balloon in, six millimeter balloon. And you can see that with gentle pulling and pushing, you are able to track the balloon over the E-wire. And you can see that we are uh, taking the sheath millimeter by millimeter. And slowly it is tracking. And with pull and push, you are able to get the memory out of this system. And you are able to uh, slide the sheath across the calcific conduit into the main pulmonary artery. Now, this is the covered stent. So I have still not interrogated the uh, conduit fully. So covered stent is positioned so that the distal most calcium is fully covered. And this is how it looks. And so we are, we are now uh, deploying the covered stent. The, this is the inner balloon 
followed by the outer balloon you can see that and initially there is no need to fully deploy the stent you can accept this particular stent position as long as it is stable and then again uh, probably look at the coronary arteries how it uh, how the coronary artery looks we did the coronary angiogram not recorded here but it was far away so we went ahead and then dilated the stent with the atlas so once we have dilated the stent with the atlas balloon then we looked at the hemodynamics of course the rv pressures have significantly come down only with the uh, only with the uh, deployment of the covered stent on a big balloon but still the rv pressure is around 70 with the systemic pressure of around 125 and the gradient has dropped to around 25 or so after dilatation with atlas the pressures in the rv have come down another 10 millimeters so here the rv pressure is around 60 to 65 with a systemic pressure of around 125 after you put the stent it is always covered stent and if you post dilate it is better to do uh, angiogram to look at what damage has been done to the conduit fortunately no damage has been done and now nor was there any problem with the coronary artery so these are the two most important things that after you deploy the stent and post dilate again check the second time with a uh, with a conduit angiogram now is the important question as to what we are going to do to these pulmonary arteries. You can see the stent coming so close to the pulmonary artery. So this decision was made well in advance that we are going to only do balloon dilatation of the pulmonary arteries with high pressure balloons. Stenting these pulmonary arteries without a covered stent would be difficult because that would probably come in the way of putting a stent for forming a landing zone. And if you were to put a covered stent through one of the arteries, it will be impossible because then we will lose the access to the other artery. So our policy, which was decided well in advance, was to create a landing zone, then deal with the branch PAs, and then uh, put in a melody valve. So this is a, a severe stenosis. I mean, a, this is a stenosis of the right pulmonary artery, not severe but significant. And this is a, a significant stenosis of the left pulmonary artery. Both of both these stenosis were dealt with by uh, by these high pressure balloons. These are 14 millimeter balloons, Mustang balloons, and uh, this is the picture that you can see. I think reasonably uh, good flow in the pulmonary arteries, and the gradient from around 30 35 came to around 15 millimeters. Of course, under anesthesia. So once we were happy with the branch PAs, once we were happy with the landing zone. Now comes the melody valve. You can see the melody again. It was not easy to get the melody, but with push and pull, you can slowly uh, forward the melody millimeter by millimeter. There is no rush, as uh, Z very rightly said. You can take your time to get the melody into the center of the, of the landing zone. And then uh, uh, we went ahead with the uh, opening of the inner balloon and then opening of the outer balloon. And once the melody was put in, you can see the uh, see the pulmonary artery tracing. Uh, the pulmonary regurgitation is gone, so ventricularization of PA just disappears. The PA uh, systolic pressure is uh, less than uh, is uh, is around 50, with a systemic pressure of around 120. And you can see that RV pressure is around 60, with a systemic pressure of around 120. So. 50% RV pressure and a gradient of around 10 millimeters across the pulmonary valve, which we thought was good. And this is the final angiogram arteries with no pulmonary regurgitation in PA and no pulmonary regurgitation in lateral. So the conclusions as far as this case is concerned that this was a challenging case because there were challenges in planning mainly in relation to branch pulmonary artery stenosis, whether to address, not to address, when to address the pulmonary artery stenosis before creating a landing zone, after creating a landing zone, how to address them with balloon, with the stents, with the bare metal stents, covered stents, so on and so forth. And I just uh, showed you what was our approach. There were challenges in ex execution because of the tracking of large and long sheath because of one failed attempt. A few things that we learned out of this case, a proper guide wire position, a stiff sheath. The sheath that we use is a devil sheath, 
not a cook sheet because cook sheet is easy to track, but it is very soft. So there are chances of it getting deformed once you remove the dilator. And of course, using the balloon support instead of dilator support. I'll quickly run through the second case before I conclude. This is a 76 year old lady who had a tetralogy repaired in 1990, had a metronic freestyle 23 millimeters in 2009, a attempted balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty in 2014. Of course, it failed and patient then uh, became more and more symptomatic, had an episode of atrial fibrillation with RV dysfunction and presented to us in NYHA class four, had to be admitted and stabilized before we contemplated, uh, uh, contemplated percutaneous pulmonary valve implant. So this is an RV pressure of around 60 to 65 with a systemic pressure of around 90. And uh, this was a coronary angiogram and you can see a severe lesion in the left circumflex, which was fortunately a spasm. And you can see that after nitroglycerin, the spasm has completely disappeared in, in, uh, in the circumflex artery. Now, this is the uh, RAO, shallow RAO cranial projection, a severe stenosis of the bioprosthetic valve. And you can see here the lateral projection, a severe stenosis. So this metronic freestyle valve, you will have to have some idea as to what is happening. Oh, I'm so sorry. So what is happening here is that uh, you can see that this measures around 18 to 19 millimeters. This is the length of the valve, which is around three centimeters. And this particular area measures around 20 millimeters. So our plan was to keep this particular portion, get it completely exteriorized so that there is no thrombus formation here, which could in the long term becomes a nidus for infection and the complication of infected endocarditis. So the plan was to entirely cover this particular uh, region using a, using a 45 millimeter CP stent over a 22 millimeter bib balloon. So since this was not a, a calcific conduit, we could take the liberty of, uh, of uh, doing what we call as the balloon interrogation. And you can see that the balloon, uh, that the coronaries are far off. This is probably the closest where the coronary comes. So we have kept a wire there in order to know how close we get once we put in a stand. And then this is the, uh, again, the devil sheet. In this case, the passage of the sheet was quite easy. And after we have put the sheet, we have gone ahead and put in a covered stand. As I said, this is a 45 millimeter CP stand there. So we are trying to uh, probably get the stent in a perfect position so that we exteriorize this dilated portion of the bioprosthetic valve. And then this is the covered stent which is being deployed. That's the inner balloon coming up. That's the outer balloon coming up. And once uh, we deployed the stent, then as usual, uh, we have done an angiogram to see that the stent is uh, nowhere uh, in proximity with the coronaries. Uh, Dr. Schubert is very finicky about coronaries. So you will see us uh, doing these angiograms now and again. And again, once you put in a, a covered stent, just want to see that uh, there is no damage done to the surrounding structures. Now, this is not a good landing zone, obviously because of the stenosis proximally. So we go ahead and put an atlas there and post dilate the stent and further atlas are going at a higher pressure so as to get rid of that small waste proximally. Having done that, again, a final coronary angiogram to see what happens once you have post dilated the stent and again, an angiogram into the, uh, into the main pulmonary artery to know that no damage has been done so far. And these are the pressures. Now you can see that there is barely a 10 millimeter gradient and the RV pressure is less than 50% of the systemic pressure. So once we are happy with the landing zone, happy with the hemodynamics, then we come back with a, with a 22 millimeter melody on a 22 ensemble. And here you can see the inner balloon going up and then the uh, outer balloon going up. And once uh, you have deployed the melody valve fully, again, as I said, because of, uh, uh, because of the protocol that we are trained, one more coronary angiogram to be sure. So this gives you a 
a definite idea as to where the coronary coronary lies because once you take the patient to the ICU and if he complains of chest pain and if you haven't done this angio, you are never sure where the coronaries were when you uh, put your valve the last time. So this is the final angiogram shows uh, just a trivial pulmonary regurgitation and this is the PA projection. So this is the post-deployment uh, uh, hemodynamics with the uh, RV pressure less than 50% and hardly 5 to 10 millimeter gradient. So in conclusion, cat-induced spasm of the coronary artery can become an issue and needs to be distinguished from a lesion by giving a, a nitroglycerin. PPVI can be performed safely and effectively in elderly. This is one of the oldest patients, even in world literature, and in very sick patients, because this was a 37 kg uh, patient who had just recovered from uh, severe heart failure. And prior medical stabilization helps. Lastly, this is the message. You know, percutaneous pulmonary valve implant is a very expensive proposition, certainly not for, uh, for economies like ours. Meaningful program in our country, to my mind, is difficult, if not impossible. There is a definite need to make our own valve. People will say, my valve. My valve is certainly not an affordable valve. So we need to make our own valve, which is affordable. And till such time we have this valve available, this seems to be a distant dream. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Bharat, uh, for a nice talk. And uh, Dr. Z, uh, your views on both the patients. The first one was a truncus with uh, mild RPA, LPA origin stenosis, yeah. severe calcific stenosis. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I think the second case was almost straightforward, so no, not much comments. But the first case, the uh, origin stenosis of the LPA and the RPA, uh, one of the strategies that I use now in the cath lab is to deploy a stent in the origin of the right pulmonary artery in this case because I think the RPA was slightly bigger than the LPA. Put a stent from the RPA all the way to the MPA, to the landing zone. Then break the strut that goes to the LPA. Then put the valve in the remaining segment in the MPA. By doing this, you will remove the origin stenosis between the LPA and the RPA because it's unless if you do kissing technique which I don't like anymore because you need to put two stents I only use one stent then I break the strut on occasion when you break the strut you may need to put a stent starting at the strut distal but most of the cases when you put a stent in the large vessel then the small vessel you break the strut and you dilate it and you will not need to do much because you need to measure the gradient. If the gradient is more than 15 millimeter mercury, then I encourage to put a stent where you broke the strut to the origin of the LPA. And then, uh, you, then you put the valve. Uh, Z, really, uh, one of the strategies was thought of. My concern about that strategy was severely calcific homograft, which was around 12, uh, I mean, uh, RVPA conduit, which was around 12 years old. Putting a, putting a non-covered stent into that calcific segment was something that was bothering me. And that is the reason why I decided to accept a suboptimum result, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but wanted to protect that calcific part of the, and it was usually calcified just underneath the, just underneath the uh, branches. So that is why we adopted this policy. But I think I take your point. You know, I think you know, your point is very valid, Bharat. But we know that most of covered stents, you can break the membrane and go to the branch. But obviously, it, it will not be appropriate to try to see if you can do it or not. So I think what you've done is perfectly acceptable. No, and, and I think we have, I do accept that this is not the most optimum result for the branches. But I had to have a trade off and decide as to what strategy I was going to use. And using just a stent at the origins was not a, a, a not was not an option here because the calcium was extending so far there that the stents would have come out into the uh, into the yeah, conduit yeah. and then placing a stent to prepare a landing zone would have been an impossibility. That I is agree. why this strategy was adopted. I agree. Yeah, the the basic uh, dictum about uh, yeah putting in a valve and preserving the longevity of the valve will will be to avoid. Yeah having a distal pulmonary artery gradient, you do understand that 
uh, with the gradient that was just less than 10 millimeters of mercury in Dr. Bharat's case in the first, uh, on both the right and the left, possibly that valve is going to have a reasonable longevity. If you have a high gradient across the branch pulmonary arteries, definitely it is going to impair the yeah. functioning of the valve. I think Absolutely. that's a very important point. I think uh, no question about it that uh, distal obstruction definitely brings down the uh, durability of the valve. And in our country, I think uh, economics being such an important thing, you must try and uh, achieve probably uh, the best possible uh, hemodynamics before you contemplate putting in a valve. This we really discussed at length with the family as well and uh, then only proceeded with this particular strategy, telling them that this might compromise the durability of the valve, given the fact that we are not able to address the distal obstruction. The other choice was, of course, a redo surgery, but they thought that uh, they would probably take this uh, option. Yeah, a couple of questions on the same issue, Dr. Bharat, that has come in the chat box. Is number one, could you have done this branch pulmonary artery dilatation with the two 14 millimeter balloons just prior to your stent positioning itself? And second, second question that was being asked is the PA dilatation that has resulted in some amount of widening of the lumen of the RPA and LPA origins, how long they are going to last? I think both are, both are sort of related, similar questions. I, I, I completely agree with you. The, the reason is, uh, you know, we, I don't like to uh, balloon dilate any area which has calcium without it being adequately protected. So that was the only concern, but we could have probably done the uh, dilatation with a 14 millimeter balloon, uh, keeping the balloons a little more distally. But I think that wouldn't change uh, much of the uh, much of our uh, management strategy overall, because we have made up our mind to go in this particular direction after discussing with the family and after uh, deciding that we may have to accept a uh, less than optimum result with high pressure balloons in the branch pulmonary arteries. But I think that was the only reason why we thought that we would first cover the calcific area and then fiddle around with pulmonary artery branches. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It was two wonderful, very, very tricky, very challenging cases. One last question that was being asked, why did you always have a PTCA wire that is running through the left coronary artery? I, I think I, it's a good idea. Basically, whenever we are dilating the, with a balloon, the, the balloons, the, the coronary guides keep slipping out and it is if you have a wire through then you can easily and go and engage it back again. It's a good strategy done by many operators. And second thing is we keep this wire at the distal most, most portion. See, everybody thinks it's only the proximal arteries but sometimes the distal artery also can be compromised or compressed. So usually we keep the wire at a place which is most close to the expected lie of the conduit know how far is the closest coronary branch close to the conduit. That is the only reason why we keep that wire there. Okay. And not everybody does it, but because Dr. Schubert is so finicky about coronary arteries for whatever reasons, and because I have learned from him, I do exactly the way he does. So in fact, it is a good idea. I would suggest basically whenever we are dilating, we, we go on balloon interrogate, and once we get the full balloon inflation and the patient is having hypotension, you tell your assistant, go ahead and do the coronary angiogram. And he often shoots it in the aortic root because the, the catheter would have slipped out. And, and if there is a small wire that is running through, usually you can re-engage and then inject. It's a good strategy. Thanks for a lot of tips that you gave through the two cases. Thank you. Shiva, I think it is your turn now. Over to you to present your experience of pulmonary valve implantation. Over sure. to you. Yeah. So I would like to make it a little bit uh, less stressful for uh, like basically whenever we talk about pulmonary valve implantation, uh, if, you, if you talk about more and more complicated cases, it actually uh, for a person who has not done a pulmonary valve, he will often think that it is unachievable. So for a change, I'm going to show some cases. Uh, the first case that I'm going to show is going to be something called as a homemade valve. Dr. Bharat in his last slide was telling there should be something that is affordable. Let me tell about what is our view about affordability. A 21 year old male with dextrocardia, corrected transposition VSDPS. The first operation was a physiological LV to PA conduit repair done at four years. About 15 years later, he comes with severe stenosis calcification of the conduit retrosternal. And this is the calcified conduit with 
significant stenosis. It is being stented with a PAMAS 4014 stent using an 18 millimeter balloon. The ventricular pressure came down from 130 to 50 and the gradient came from 110 to 20. So now we have a stent across and there is a free pulmonary regurgitation. We plan to do the first percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation in the country when India had no access to any valves. This was in the year 2012. So we took a Contagra conduit. This is a CP stent. Cut off the Contagra conduit. To, this is a 39 millimeter CP stent. Cut the proximal and distal ends. And this is a 7 0 proline stitch that is being stitched. After completing the stitch here, then that is crimped on a max, Cordis Max CLD balloon, 22 millimeter into 4 centimeters. It's a hand crimping of the stitched, uh, the, the Contagra CP stent onto the Max CLD balloon. And it is further crimped. And then with an umbilical tape, it is being tightened further. And then we needed a sheath. We wanted to know how large is this assembly. So we took it on a nine endotracheal tube. That means the inner lumen is nine millimeter. In other words, it is a 27 French endotracheal tube. And we advanced this into the nine French tube and it was freely passing through. So then we made a cut on this, uh, this nine endotracheal tube, which is actually a 27 French, say, a yes, sheath. And we put in a trocar of the intercostal drainage, uh, the trocar, into it to make it straighter. So this is going to be the ventriculotomy with this endotracheal tube. Then you made a limited thoracotomy, thanks to the surgeon, Dr. Robert Coelho, and the anesthetist, Dr. Satish. Uh, we got uh, the posturing around an initial puncture, and then this trocar was pushed in, and the valve goes inside the pre-stented conduit. And this is, the, this is the stent being expanded over the 22 into 4 uh, millimeter max CLD balloon. And then you make an injection. You find that there is not much of pulmonary regurgitation. The right pulmonary artery is here overlapping with the uh, stent. And so you are not able to see well. So then you turn it to lateral projection and you find that there is a completely good seal of the pulmonary valve. So uh, this is the thoracotomy that was done through which the, the access was taken. So having, uh, I mean, this was, this was in terms of affordability, the cost of this particular procedure was one fifth the cost of the melody valve that we are currently doing. Anyhow, now I, I would like to show a second case, which is one of the very, very simplest case with no complications at all. A tetralogy of fallow with absent pulmonary valve operated with a 22 millimeter short pulmonary homograft conduit. She's not a syndromic lady. She had moderate conduit stenosis with 50 millimeters of mercury gradient with severe pulmonary regurgitation. Quite symptomatic that she was not able to pursue her job. Regurgitant fraction was 45%. RV end diastolic volume 190 ml, ejection fraction was low. So this is the angiogram in lateral view. You can appreciate because of the absent pulmonary valve syndrome, the branch pulmonary arteries are huge, but the conduit is small and there is a free pulmonary regurgitation, the catheter is rocking. The coronary angiogram, prior to uh, inflating the balloon, just to identify where is the coronary and then the balloon is inflated, and with the balloon inflation, we do the coronary interrogation. The coronaries are reasonably far away. The next step was ensemble 22 millimeter melody 22 valve. Now, this is not pre stented so far. So, what we are doing is over the melody valve, a 43 Andra XL is crimped within the ensemble system itself. What is going here? is the melody valve and on the top of it, the Andra XL 43 millimeter. I'll show it better on the lateral projection. This is the CP stent, the, the melody valve. And you can see on either side, this is the protruding 
43 millimeter andra. So the andra is going to be the pre-stent, but it is within the ensemble system. So then the, there is no additional RV catheter. There is no additional pigtail catheter to make an RV angiogram. The side arm of the sheath is getting the, giving the injection and we are in good position. Then we inflate the inner balloon. Again, check the position. Then you inflate the outer balloon. And then finally a coronary check to ensure that the coronaries are not affected at all. And then you take out the nose cone. You check the RV through the sheath. Take out the nose cone. The, uh, the valve, the, the ensemble assembly, assembly comes out. And final angiogram. This angiogram shows that the valve is in good position. Again, a repeat in the lateral view. So I, I just wanted to show that sometimes pulmonary valve implantation can be extremely this simple. This was a stenosed conduit. We did not go for a pre-stenting and the pre-stenting was actually combined with the valve. Simple one-shot deployment, short procedural time, rewarding hemodynamics, the final RVOT gradient less than 10 millimeters of mercury without any PR, a two-year follow-up, no issues on aspirin as well as plavix. Uh, I, I know that there will be, like people will be interested to see something very complex, but I just wanted to share two very simple cases. Thanks, uh, Shiva, for those uh, wonderful cases. The first case, absolutely terrific. I think something like that is required if we can do it percutaneously using our, uh, you know, uh, our originality and ingeniousness to get these valves, maybe a crimped uh, contegra into the pulmonary position which can reduce the cost to 20% of what it costs now. My question to you is regarding the second case. Why did you do it in one state? What is the advantage? Actually, the, the, the Melody uh, valve, the ensemble system is such a beautiful system that it is very sleek. We have used the other valves also. Co compared to taking a Sapien or a My valve or a Venus valve across the RBOT, Ensemble is one of the simplest to take. It is, it, is, it is customized in such a way that it will direct you directly into the right ventricular outflow tract into your landing zone. Unfortunately, in a 22 millimeter ensemble system, after you crimp the valve, still there is a room for two more stents to be placed if you are using an Andra XL and one stent to place if you are using a covered CT stent. That amount of room is there between the the, the, the crimped valve and the outer sleeve of an Ensemble 22 system. So with so much of space, a good number of operators across the world do this way. They put in a stent inside because having, like for example, if I had to do this pre-stenting with a 43, I would have needed another balloon, a, a sheath. The sheath should have gone across the right ventricular outflow tract. So there is much more hardware that I need. And second thing is, after I put in the pre-stent, I will be scared to immediately take the valve with the fear of whether I might dislodge that stent. Whereas taking the Andra XL, in fact, two Andra XLs can be crimped on a 22 ensemble system on the top of a melody valve. But in was case, this a, was this conduit a calcific conduit or a non-calcific? It is a. It is. It was a 22 millimeter pulmonary homograph, which was minimally calcified. So my, my only concern is that when you do this... Yeah, if it is more calcified, you can put in a 45 millimeter covered CP stent and there is a space in ensemble for one covered CP stent or two Andra XL stents. My concern is if there is an accident. If there is an accident with a calcific conduit and uh, uh, if you are not able to interrogate the coronaries properly without a pre-stand, um, my feeling is that you could get no, no, no. into... The coronary, the coronary was interrogated before with a balloon expand, balloon testing. We always do a balloon testing and with... In fact, I, I, I have a small difference in the way I approach. Before I put in the stent, I will always balloon interrogate to the same diameter what I am going to finally stent. Uh, the, the risk of that particular procedure is that you may have a rupture of the conduit, but what we do is yes, sort of a slow inflation progressively. In, in, uh, all of our calcified conduit, what we do is 
we will start with a 10 millimeter balloon, 10, 12, then 14, 16, 18, keep on doing multiple angiographies. And finally, then only we will take the stent. We don't take a stent prior. Shiva, Shiva this rupture will happen all or none. And it will happen only once. People have reported rupture not only with z made balloon, but also with AGA sizing balloon. And that is what has uh, given me jitters or concerns so that I would prefer that I put in a covered stent before interrogating with a balloon. And let the covered stent be deployed not completely, incompletely. Look at the coronary. Go one millimeter ahead. Look at the coronary and keep on increasing if the concerns about coronary are that big. I would like to know what is Z's opinion on interrogating a calcific conduit as far as coronaries are concerned. Yeah, I think you, you know, you're right, uh, Bharat. I would like, you know, you know any calcific conduit, uh, I would insist on cover the stent and the gradual inflation, check coronaries, inflation, because if you go from one size to a large size and you end with the section, although it is uh, covered the stent, the tear may be beyond the covering and you will still have mediastinal leak. So I usually go gradual like you and uh, make sure that, you know, I check the coronary arteries because sometimes when you inflate, there's a shift of calcium in the mediastinum. Absolutely. Although the distance may look far, but there is shift and there might be some narrowing. So gradual inflation. There's no reason to hurry and to say, well, I'm going to go to the size and then you will pay the, the, the price. Yeah, Shiva, you can... Uh... Uh, no, I think Sushil wanted to say something. Yeah. Sorry, Sushil. I just wanted to make a comment that whenever we do balloons, uh, balloon interrogation, most of the time it is done with a compliant balloon. We never use a non-compliant balloon. So whatever stretching of the conduit that happens, it is not that much stretching. So putting a stain directly without interrogating the uh, how much stretching will happen, how whether it will compress at that time, by using just a compliant balloon won't, won't be a wise idea, I think. I agree with you. I think that's why you have to use the Atlas balloon, high pressure, non-compliant balloon. And the final diameter of the stent, let's say your final diameter, 23 millimeter that you want to put 23 millimeter inwards, maybe go with, uh, with this uh, Atlas balloon to up to 20, 22 millimeter, then you put your valve. I agree. Yeah, the, uh, about uh, there are, uh, there are no specific questions here in the once it's a conduit it's always calcified is there a relation between the amount of calcification on imaging and the incidence of rupture not to my knowledge yeah i think you know we had rupture in conduits that has very little calcium on x-ray and no rupture nothing when you even have heavily calcium so every every and that's why you have to do the steps in every patient because and not predictable. And okay. every calcium should be respected. Yeah, don't, I uh, don't under underestimate any calcium. Yeah, our in in, in my hospital the, the policy that we follow, uh, we don't want to put in a stent into the right ventricular outflow tract if that particular conduit is going for a surgery uh, because of its rigidity that it is not going to be giving giving uh, way to a dilatation. So what we follow is. We will start off, in fact, very often the, the problem will start with even the catheter finding it difficult to cross. So the moment we get the guide wire in and we put in a small diagnostic catheter, then subsequently we will put in one of the very stiff wires like a Landerquist. We will start with very small balloons, which may sometimes even be a 6 millimeter or an 8 millimeter mustang, and then, then do a check angiogram. Then you take a 10 or 12 millimeter conquest. Then you do a check angiogram. 14 or 16 atlas, then check angiogram. 18, then check angiogram. The reason is, suppose if I have to go in and put in a balloon with a stent across, and finally, for some reason, that particular patient is not going to be amenable for a conduit stenting followed by a percutaneous valve, the cost of the stent is quite a lot. So this is the, this is the policy that we follow. We go for a very stepwise balloon dilatation. In, I, one more thing about even people who are having a circumferential calcification and when you are balloon dilating and you see that the calcium breaks and the calcium actually splits up, it's still, what we, it, it does not mean that all these patients will have a complete through and through rupture across. So, we, I, in, in fact, during those, uh, those dilatation, we will be using a lot of caution. For example, if I'm taking a 14 millimeter atlas, 
initially i will be dilating it only to two or three atmospheres then withdraw the uh, the the contrast back then look at it for some time make some check shots then again inflate the same like it it will be a sort of a, 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 a procedure that takes quite a long time and in fact that was the reason why i wanted to show this particular case because this is the only case where i did not do anything at all normally my the conduit stents and followed by the valve that we do will be a very time consuming procedure we do it for 2 hours 2 and 1/2 hours we start off with one balloon and we, by the end of the procedure i will have eight balloons lying on the uh, bin but uh, but this this seemed very simple so i just wanted to uh, show some of the uh, participants that sometimes a valve can be extremely be simple Okay, it I think for the, we are not for the first time as to try like that. Uh, I think uh, we'll move on to the next speaker now. I don't know whether it is Muthu or whether it is Sushil. I oh, don't have the program in front of me, so probably Satya will have to. It's me, Bharat. Okay, Muthu, go ahead. we can see you and we can see the screen why don't you go ahead muthu uh, just second but uh, i just got a different uh, thing inside you can stop the sharing and then reshare again sir yeah i'll do that just second yeah. right sir. or maybe sushil you can present and then muthu will identify the yeah, powerpoint right if sushil is ready let sushil start and then muthu can come back i got it now yeah yeah good sir we have dr warakan and dr chetan uh, also in the uh, like uh, i i saw their pictures very briefly yes sir oh so we can invite them for some comments sure hi hi warakan hi hi bharat good to see you again Yeah, so I'm I'm so enjoyable listening to all you guys uh you know experiencing and um at, at the moment I think just listen and if anything I want to ask or share I'll I'll, I'll let you know. Thanks. So, okay. Hi Chetan. Hi hi Shiva how are you? Doing very well. Enjoyed Doing your good. talk yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys I'm just a, I'm just about to get scrubbed to start a tight LPS stenosis. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I saw you and Vinay say hi to him also. Yes, I will. I will because I thought the talks were quite nice, so I wanted to listen to them, both yours and Bharat's. Fantastic cases. I think Bharat's uh, that bifurcation stenosis is a quite a debatable case in terms of yeah. what do you deal with, how much can you allow the stenosis to remain? Because the as you as you already pointed out, the longevity of the valve is going to be depending upon how much distal stenosis you have. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, can I proceed, Bharat? Uh, Go for it. Can you see my slides? Um, can you see my slides, Bharat? Yes, yes, we can see your slides and we can hear you well. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Sadhya and Nusri, for organizing this lovely meeting, and thanks to Bharat, Shiva, and uh, Ziad um, for uh, for for a nice talk. So our experience with Tamil valve implantation is very limited. I have done about uh, three, but we done extensively on aortic valve and other valves. so this is case is a interesting case that i'm sharing with you all this is a lady is 24 year old presented with breathlessness and exertion she never in a which class 3 she had a tetralogy fellow operated um so sorry she didn't have it all she had a permanent stenosis for which she, she had a balloon valvotomy at uh, twice at 2 years and 3 years of age and she had a open permanent valvotomy For a still PS, and she had a left hemi on normal permanent genitals diagnosed at this time, a uh, repad, and she came to us at 18 years of age only. She presented to us where we replaced her, uh, we replaced RV to PA conduit with 18 mm contagra graft for free PR, 
and then on follow up uh, she developed a, a stenosis to the conduit for which i did balloon dilatations and um, they improved the situation uh, transiently but still she went on to have breathlessness so this x ray of her and uh, an an ecg to show an rvh and so this echo suggesting a, a gain of 4 meters per second across the pulmonary valve and uh, good function preserved lv and rv function so this is a case where the clear cut rvot obstruction which is recurring and not get uh, going away with the balloon dilatation so this she uh, is a candidate for a pulmonary valve implantation so we did a ct scan to look at the coronaries and also looking at the conduit the conduit not that heavily calcified like uh, barrett's uh, calcification was not uniform only uh, only it's not circumferential and the maximum uh, diameter we got caught by ct scan is 20 mm and uh, the ct uh, didn't suggest there's no, any major coronary anomaly anyway but we have to do a balloon interrogation so the plan was to do a transcatheter pulmonary valve implantation and uh, shiva uh, asked us to be part of the act at this time and um, uh, i don't know why i accepted to do this case and uh, particularly as a live case and i would have really uh, wanted to do a pre stent the rvot and and uh, then maybe go on for the implantation but since the act came there we we spoke to her people and said you can do a stenting and go for for the implantation as team city so i went for a live case we thought of using a myval we had good experience with myval in tower positions uh, iotic valve positions so we thought of using a uh, uh, myval uh, since it's a 18 mm contagra valve i thought of a 20 or 23 depending on the balloon dilatation if i use atlas balloon and if, the, if i see a good compliance of the of the of the obot with the 20 mm atlas balloon then i'll go for a 23 uh, valve otherwise i thought of using a 20 valve that's a strategy i had so we started at 8 am to go live at 11 am so that's a my valve my valve as uh, you know bharat and dr jasi pointed out the new uh, valve in our uh, amontorium for pulmonary uh, implantation um, and it's more or less similar to the edwards sapiens valve but only the advantage of this one or sapiens valve is if you can't deploy the valve inside the heart you can retrieve it back inside the sheath and uh, next thing is um, um, it, it has got extra sizes available around like it got uh, 20 21.5 24.5 and 27.5 and latestly you can have a 30 mm valve also these are advantages of this uh, my valve so under ga access right femoral vein right femoral artery igv for central line access the eye pressure measured 60 uh, around around uh, uh, half systemic and uh, rv angiogram was done a three rotational angiography uh, was attempted uh, and then a lateral and um, an rao position was done so you can see here uh, rotational angiography uh, as you say it, it rotates around you can see there's a two two sides of obstruction at the valvular level and sub, and, and the supravalvular level also if you look at this uh, rao projection you can see there is an obstruction at this point and also at uh, a small narrowing also seen uh, just before the bifurcation so in in lateral projection we did see the same thing and i did want to stent uh, the entire area uh, from uh, covering the entire uh, conduit so that you know we can put a, a good, give a good landing zone for pulmonary valve uh, it measured at 37 mm so we took a 43 uh, andromet Uh, covered stent. Uh, the reasons I use a covered stent is the calcification and avoid about rupture. Um, so we thought of using a covered stent. So um, we parked the lunatus wire deep in the LPA. That's something uh, you know uh, we uh, you know advised by a lot of people to do. So we parked the uh, lunatus wire deep in the LPA, and uh, atlas gold balloon was taken across a 20 mm atlas balloon, and uh, there's complete loss of waste. and we didn't do a selective coronary angiography but we got good view with the pigtail injection also so one view only uh, we, i got it here but there is no obstruction we could see so uh, we uh, after this injection we felt there's a good compliance of this of uh, this uh, uh, rvot so we thought of going for 23 val that's a plan we proceeded so we took a 14 french um, 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 braided sheath which is a life tech sheath the avel dove sheath big issue here so we used a 14 mm braided sheet and then uh, we uh, start to uh, sort of get the stent across the stent was crimped over a andra balloon which is 60 uh, mm not 60 mm 60 mm balloon 
and uh, taken across the IOT. So this nightmare starting time is 9.45 when uh, things were not going well. I started to inflate, I think things were going well. I started to inflate the balloon, but uh, what happened is the balloon uh, pushed this stain forward. It's not expanding the balloon, in fact, it's melon seeding away from the balloon. So uh, this is the, what happened. So what I did is I tried to pull the balloon out and uh, do some inflations uh, proximally um, and distally. It wasn't really, uh, uh, you know, expanding the stent. At this point of time, I had difficulty in getting the balloon inside the uh, sheet also. And uh, we see here the balloon is, uh, you know, is brought into the sheet, but I had difficulty in getting across the sheet. I did, I did you know, inflate the balloon entirely into the RV and then again try to take inside, but uh, the balloon would not come to the sheet. So finally, um, um, we sort of, you know, out of force, whatever we did, we could not come inside. So what I did is I took the, I leave, left the wire inside, uh, I took the balloon as far as possible into the sheet and took the sheet away and the balloon away as, as one assembly. So it just came out and balloon didn't have any damage and the balloon came out. So we had a stent or the wire through, which is an undergust wire in the LPA. So what I thought is I replaced the groin sheet with the 14 French uh, short sheet. Then we took up, uh, um, uh, instead of taking a smaller balloon or a balloon which is less, uh, smaller balloon and, and go across the stent balloon again. So I took an Andromed um, 16 millimeter by four centimeter balloon, which can go inside here, it went inside nicely. So then we start to inflate. So what happened? The same thing started to happen. As I was inflating the balloon, this stain would not dilate. Either it goes forward, if I go proximal distally and dilate, it comes backwards. So this kind of uh, you know, difficulty in expanding the stain. And, uh, and I, I, what I did is then at this point of time, I thought of trying an atlas balloon. So what we did, we, we exchanged it for 16 French uh, mullein sheet. We didn't have a braided sheet. So I have to take a 16 French mullein sheet there. So we took a 16 French mullein sheet, then took a um, Atlas balloon. This is Atlas gold. It's a Atlas gold 18 centimeter by four centimeter, 18 millimeter by four centimeter Atlas balloon is taken across. Once across, um, Atlas is slowly inflated, and uh, as the prox, you can see that you know that again the same thing is happening. The stent would not uh, really you know expand, and uh, we were uh, running out of ideas. Uh, if I do it distally, it the stent uh, proximally migrates. If you do proximally, the stent uh, migrates distally. This is what's happening like zigzag movement, and the stent will not dilate. So I, we, we did try a lot of things, like we, I did use a um, 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 cook balloon also, Tolemum, but it wasn't doing any, 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 any use for us. So we finally managed to get the stent, the proximal stent flared, and it prevented the stent from coming down into the RV. And um, the surgeons were involved, and uh, they, they want us to go on live at this 11 o'clock time, so they should possibly have to say what, what can be done. So uh, we went live and showed what has happened. A lot of suggestions flowed and uh, I was really running out of options what to do because whatever we do, this, this tent is not expanding. So, um, and we did uh, have, luckily have a bit, I know, uh, balloons arranged at different sizes and different lengths. So uh, we had this um, uh, Mustang balloon, which is uh, eight centimeter by 12 millimeter Mustang balloon, which is a long balloon. So luckily we had the balloon, the shell, so we thought of using a longest balloon, so there's no escape for this stent to migrate anywhere so that you know it will it will dilate the it will dilate the stent. So as the uh, Mustang, you can see here this is a long loop. I just found it for you. Uh, as the loop is played, you can see this is a very tough uh, leash in the center. I know the, uh, the stent is having a fault. It took a long time for the stent to expand and it did finally expand. So this tells you that you know we should have a, you know a, a variety of balloons inside the cath lab so that we can get away from the situation. So this really expanded the stent. Uh, that's the final position of stent. Then I after this one I took up a atlas balloon. Um, the atlas balloon would not go further than that. So we tried uh, ballooning it up, but you can see the atlas uh, as the atlas balloon inflates, it the stent moves down. So there's one more obstruction at this point. 
which is sort of, you know, uh, the stain doesn't cover. So uh, I did an angiogram and see what, where we are at this point. And uh, you can see uh, the stent is in a good position in the RV, in RVOT, but the, I would possibly want the stent to cover this area as well. So we took one more Andromed stent uh, and we're hoping that this stent would not play up like what happened previously. And uh, luckily it did uh, expand well and um, uh, we finally took up Atlas uh, 20mm balloon for the entire stent assembly. The whole thing got expanded nicely. Then the next task is taking this uh, my valve across. So quite a difficult uh, uh, maneuver, but actually as the Bharat said, we are pushing and pulling, trying to get this across. And uh, I, was, I was not very happy with the position where the my valve is sitting now, because you can see there's obstruction there. And I would ideally want the valve to lie here rather than below the obstruction. You can see yes, I sort of, you know, uh, uh, ways in this position. So, uh, but I tried several maneuvers, but still then it wasn't really moving. At this point, we thought we should slowly inflate the balloon and then we know as we inflate, we can push the uh, valve inside to get the position. So we had went for a very slow inflation. So uh, you can see now the valve is getting inflated. We want position there. So it went for slow inflation. As we inflating, we pushed it tightly and it took, went into the nice position and then we went for full inflation. And, uh, and the and the valve expanded very well. And post angio, the post angio showed no uh, uh, no PR, and um, you can see uh, the hemodynamics with high pressure 46. There was a gradient, mild gradient across the pulmonary pulmonary valve, but this time we are about four hours into procedure. We didn't want to go for any balloon dilatation. We exhibited on table and uh, discharge the next day. And three months on follow up, she didn't have any gradient, and there's no PR now, and she's doing well. So um, we have about, uh, since 2017, we have done about 19 towers so far. We had two uh, mitrals, trans mitrals, two uh, uh, tax valve replacements, and three primary valves so far in my valve experiment. And, uh, we had good procedural success with this valve. So my valve from India is emerging valve, primary valve implantation. Uh, as such, the cost is very high still, but uh, we are negotiating with the companies to see whether they can make special packages for particular primary valve implantations. Pre-stenting makes life easier, particularly here on air road and calcified RVOT. Have lengthy balloons in shell, maybe a, 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 a range of balloons which can bail you out. And thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Muthu. That was a that was a, a real nightmare. What exactly, Dr. Z, you think is the problem? Why did the stent fail to dilate? Uh, why did the stent fail to expand at all? Uh, so, do you hear me? Yeah, Dr. Z, now we can, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, th this is a problem here. Uh, whether the crimping on the balloon was of a certain way where the holes got blocked or something, I mean, I, I really can't explain it aside from saying that maybe the crimping had something to do with it. That's the only thing. What I would have done in such cases, I would have passed, instead of a big balloon like what you were trying, a coronary balloon. Coronary balloons will go at least once you have larger diameter, then you can put a, a big balloon or something to uh, expand uh, in a more controlled fashion. But at the end, you've got very good result. The only thing that the proximal part of the stent, I would have blurred it even more uh, so that you will be able to go in and out in the future, but very good result. Congratulations. Uh, Dr. Muthu, just to be curious, did you use a mechanical crimper or is it a hand crimper on the balloon? Was it a mechanical crimper? It's a hand crimp only. I didn't use a mechanic because we used a 14 foot sheet, uh, uh, Shiva. Yeah. And we used uh, the balloon. Uh, what we require for the thing is only a, a, the, the uh, balloon goes, balloon is a 10 French sheet. 10 French, so we only need a 12 French. We took 14 French sheet inside. So I wasn't really crimping it hard. So mm. I don't know. I don't know what might happen. Shiva, Shiva, have you seen Muttu's biceps diameter? <laughs> <laughs> the mechanical crimp. Yeah. Uh, that's no, the reason. I have a couple of uh, I have a couple of uh, uh, points to make. Just one point I will make. My entire skeletal muscle mass will be equal to his right biceps. <laughs> <laughs> Boy. So, uh, so the point I wanted to make is that uh, I have had a similar experience once, where the balloon inflated proximally, 
but in your case despite going digitally it was not that is something uh, i cannot explain unless there is a problem with uh, the design of the stand that's what i thought but what i feel hmm. is that there are two things whenever you hand crimp in order that the stand should not move we tend to crimp a little hard and in doing so the proximal part of the balloon and distal part of the balloon get disconnected now when such a thing happens it will be always the proximal part which will dilate and the stent will move forward so our policy has been that whenever we have a hand crimped and not a pre mounted stent we will not remove the sheath till such time i can see that there is a continuity of the column into the distal part of the balloon only when i see the contrast in the distal part of the balloon i will remove the uh, uh, sheath and then i will go up in that case you will rarely lose your stent uh, over the balloon i'm not saying it can never happen but in your case i cannot expect after sending a second balloon also why it did not happen despite the fact that you covered the proximal end despite that it was not happening the mustang also the bharat we see the way they expanding it yeah. was having so, difficulty in expanding i think it caused the stent and that stent looked a little ugly to me so probably there was something with the stent and the second comment i wanted to Probably make there was a twist of the stent as it was getting crimped that it is it is not somewhere expanding maybe, at all maybe. because the the prior balloon dilatation was beautiful like it it was almost like an 18 to 20 mm lumen and so definitely there is a space within the within the conduit and possibly it is a twist of the andra stent uh, covered stent i'm using andra covered stent shiva that's what i used to use andra excel uncovered and never used andra covered uh, because of cost implication we used andra covered uh, you know i never encountered uh, you know i don't i don't know what, uh, you know, we, we, we have we have used it more than about 35 to 40 stents it's a very 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 good stent uh, but i am also not able to understand the physics of why that stent was not getting uh, inflated one thing as dr z was telling whether there was some sort of a block in the lumen of uh, the dye injection port to the distal part of the balloon where at least four five balloons were shiva and it was placed center and i didn't expand at all you know and i uh, you know if you have really that balloon problem took the balloon off and, and luckily for us the stent is allowing balloon through and through every time balloon goes through entirely so that's a good to use lot of new balloons still then it don't expand and the only other comment i wanted to make muttu was regarding the uh, the first stent which came proximally when the stent comes proximally to this extent into the right ventricle muscular right ventricular outflow tract there are always chances of these stents breaking over a period of time because of the continue so you will have to keep a close watch because this patient might then present with a, a rvot obstruction or some such thing so you will have to keep a close watch on the right ventricle as well as on the pulmonary valve Varad and Shiva Kumar, I have to leave. The uh, my CEO is waiting for me. You know. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for having you. spending this long time. Happy Ramadan for uh, when it's starting so tomorrow morning. And thank stay you. healthy and stay safe. I'll try. You two guys, stay yeah. safe. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, 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 thanks a lot. Thank thanks you. Thanks so I think we'll move on to the last talk of the day, and that will be uh, Sushil Azad from Sushil from Escorts will uh, deliver that talk. Sushil, go ahead. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. We can hear you well, loud and clear. Just let me do this. So, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Satya, for this wonderful experience that we are having in this lockdown days. Uh, after having listened to all these tall words, my I would try to match up to them. So what I am going to present is, though I don't have much experience, we have only initial experience. So I would like to concentrate on the challenges that we face while planning these cases and subsequently execution of these cases. So as we all know, we have heard all other previous speakers saying it is now a standard part of a standard practice across many centers in uh, Europe and North America. but it still continues to be in a nascent stage with very few selected centers doing this procedures so i'm going to present our experience and what the challenges that we faced so the background as we have already seen this slide previously as well the anomalies of rvot primarily majority of these patients are tetralogy who have underwent a total correction with a transanular patch 
and majority of the patients fall into this subgroup and of these majority of the patients only few selected patients are usually suitable for percutaneous spinal valve implantation the other limited number of patients usually are repaired with using a rv 2 pa conduit and virtually all these patients will require future reintervention to change the conduit by putting either a valve or surgically replacing them so whenever we have a conduit dysfunction the options are limited either you do a surgery or you do a transcatheter the transcatheter involves intervention involve either using a balloon or a bare metal stent which are usually not long lasting so the added uh, so the uh, important thing is using a tra transcatheter pulmonary valve implantation so our initial experience is usually limited to the four cases that we have usually so far attempted out of which three were successful and one was not successful uh two were using two had a degenerative bioprosthetic valve and one patient had a dysfunctional rv2 pa conduit the unsuccessful case also had a dysfunctional rv2 pa conduit the mean age was 17.6 years mean weight was 69 69.3 kilos the average procedure time as expected was long approximately two and a half hours so the first case was a 18 years old boy who was a case of tetralogy already underwent a palliative surgery way back in 2000 subsequently total correction was done with lk plast in 2001 subsequently had a pulmonary valve replacement using a carpentier edwards valve in 2010 this was a 23 mm size uh, carpentier edwards valve now presented with severe rv ot ot dysfunction and uh, rv dysfunction and rv ot obstruction So this was the echo. We can clearly see the RV is severely dysfunction. RV is obstructed. There is some amount of pulmonary regurgitation as well. So as a routine part of our evaluation, we do the cardiac MR. This gives us basic anatomic as well as functional information. So once we did the MRI, we found it little suitable for the percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation. We discussed it with our proctor, and he also felt the same. And subsequently, this case was planned for uh, percutaneous pulmonary valve balloon uh, implantation. but as a routine we also do all the balloon interrogation which was done and the coronaries were evaluated and they were found to be far up, far away from the valve and so uh, this patient was taken up for a percutaneous valve implantation in the second sitting so as uh, was mentioned by dr jiad the uh, usually we have to be uh, try and achieve a maximum size uh, we if we use a high pressure balloon like an atlas we can by dilating it at very high pressure we can give one or two mm extra that gives us a, a advantage of putting a, a a bigger size balloon at the first go but we always keep doing check angio coronary angiograms to look for any obstruction in the coronaries and subsequently once we have done that this uh, the subsequent angiograms clearly show that the my valve uh, this uh, melody valve was taken in and subsequently implanted and the last angiogram shows the uh, valve perfectly in place and no obstruction the second case again subsequently we were we were very lucky in the first two cases were uh, both had a percutaneous uh, the pulmonary valve implantation was already done surgically this case had a 23 mm paramount aortic valve and uh, now presented to us with severe rv ot obstruction and rv dysfunction so this is the echo we can clearly see heavily calcified valve on the echo cardiogram with Uh, severe obstruction and moderate to severe pulmonary regurgitation as well in this particular case and the rv is dysfunctional as you can clearly see now again similar procedure balloon interrogation was done and the coronaries were evaluated and in both the views and the coronaries were found to be uh, far away from the valve and this patient was subsequently planned for the percutaneous valve implantation and in the second sitting and was taken up for the procedure since coronary is not a major issue so uh, uh, the valve was taken and implanted in a very successful way and last angiogram clearly shows the valve is well in position and so there is no leakage the point that i want to highlight whenever we are evaluating a bioprosthetic valve we have to understand that the true inner diameter is uh, different from whatever the diameter of the valve which has been implanted so we have to understand that so there is a app which is available which which we put the type of the valve the size of the valve we can clearly come to know about the what is the true inner diameter the other important thing that i want to highlight is that whenever we are evaluating the dysfunctional bioprosthetic valve we have to understand what is the mechanism of the failure 
if it is just a tear in the valve leaflet usually then the inner diameter will correspond to the actual inner diameter but if it is calcified as it was in our second case the inner diameter may be actually far lower than the actual inner diameter which is there so we have to understand that and take into consideration while planning for the uh, uh, percutaneous valve the other important thing as was mentioned by dr jiad was that if you inflate these uh, some of these valves we, uh, they may fracture and they can they tend to fracture but they usually require a very high pressure and once they fracture they give you extra 1 to 2 mm so that you can implant a higher uh, the larger diameter valve so the third case which i really want to present it was this is a very one of the toughest of uh, till date though we have done only four this was a case 24 years old who was a case of bsg pulmonary atresia and subsequently rv to pa conduit was done and the patient uh, had another rv to pa conduit revision with a 22 mm 20 mm contagra in 2007 so currently presented with conduit obstruction with regurgitation and severe rv dysfunction so this is the echo you can clearly see our rv is dilated as was the case the coronary compression testing was planned was done but unfortunately during the coronary compression testing as you can clearly see the left coronary was not the issue but we were not able to hook the right coronary artery at all no matter how we tried so since we were not sure what is happening to the right coronary artery we did a ct angiography and this was the ct angiogram you can clearly see how heavily calcified this conduit is the minimum diameter was 10.6 mm the maximum above was 17.6 mm but look at the coronary because of the dextro rotation of the aorta the coronary was coming just inter between between the uh, conduit and the aorta so this was a concern as you can see in this view as well the coronary is very close to the calcific specs now we discuss it with our proctor dr shubert who helps us in this cases and we are very uh, thankful to him for training us for this so we discussed with him the issues was that the rca is adjacent and maybe just below the calcium but the coronary compression whether it will happen or not we were not very sure the as uh, demonstrated by the angiography the left coronary artery was not at risk if you go by the dimension they were perfectly suitable for pulmonary valve implantation the only issue was the rc right coronary artery compression which can which could not be ruled out till now so what we planned was we'll go ahead with the procedure we'll uh, first put a cover stand and gradually dilate it and look for the coronary at each and every step if at some point of time we feel that the coronary is getting compromised will back out so with that preparation in mind with that planning in mind we went ahead and uh, took, took the patient the first and foremost important was to hook the coronary since in the first attempt it was very difficult for us to hook the coronary but this time fortunately we were successful using an al1 catheter the coronary was hooked it was coming in quite entirely and ct definitely helped us in planning how to hook the uh, right coronary artery so once we hook the place as is uh, as is our protocol we always keep the coronary wire into the coronary so that the catheter doesn't move out during the inflation procedure and we don't have to again try and struggle for hooking the coronary arteries so this was done and subsequently we did a the company using a compliant balloon did a coronary compression testing but uh, in this lateral view it was looking very close but once we did an ap cranial projection we can clearly see there is quite a distance between the coronary and the conduit the diameter of the conduit but as dr dalvi had pointed out this is just the internal diameter what happens it expand which way the calcium go we don't know so with that with that precaution in mind we went ahead and took the stent this was a 45 mm covered stent we inflated uh, it gradually initially using an 18 mm uh, balloon and so once we inflated we checked the coronary the, there was no coronary compression at all the coronary flow was absolutely more normal then we took an atlas balloon and dilated it further so that we could get the adequate diameter internal diameter to implant a 22 mm ensemble system so once we had done that this is the ensemble system which is going in and subsequently after adequate position once we have put this stent then it becomes relatively easy so the after adequate positioning of the stent this was inflated using a bit balloon this is the final position and subsequently uh, this is the final angiogram we checked again the coronary arteries because that was our major concern 
and the coronary, there was absolutely no compression of the coronary artery uh, in all the views that we checked. And so we took out the ensemble system, and this is the final angiogram. And after the final angiogram, also, as Dr. Bharat men mentioned, Dr. Schubert is very particular about this coronary artery. So we again checked the coronary artery, and there was absolutely no compromise in the flow of the coronary artery. And the hemodynamic result was also uh, quite satisfactory. Now, just to uh, complete, this was the details of the unsuccessful case. The problem that Dr. Dalvi faced, we also faced in this particular case. So this was a patient, 14-year-old, with a TGA VSG pulmonary atresia, subsequently had a rascally surgery done with a 16 millimeter RV to PA conduit. Now presented to us with our severe RV this conduit dysfunction. Now, uh, we did, as our plan, we did the uh, coronary compression testing prior, coronary angiogram was also done. The only issue was the left coronary artery, which we felt was quite close to the, uh, uh, the conduit. So again, the same planning was done. We, the uh, plan was to put a stent, gradually expand the stent and look for any coronary compression. So with the compliant balloon, there was absolutely no coronary compression. So we uh, planned to take the stent. But before taking the stent, we were trying to take the mullein sheath across to the conduit. But multiple attempts, whatever uh, tricks that uh, Dr. Bharat described in his talk, we tried inflating a balloon across the end of the sheath, pushing, pulling, whatever. But the sheath was not able to cross. Probably there was some calcium streak there, which was not allowing the sheet to cross the uh, conduit and thus uh, whatever efforts that we made so that the sheet is there, that we, can, we can implant a stand and subsequently plan, we were not able to do that. So subsequently, after discussing, we just backed out and came out and uh, we abandoned the procedure and referred the patient for surgery. So this was the difficulty that we faced. So uh, majority of the patients, as we know that, are usually uh, used, basically the cases of Hoki direction with trans patch. And the RBOT in most of them is unusually dilated. In our, whenever we, for last two years, we have aggressively evaluating all these patients for the uh, suitability of percutaneous valve. Of the 10 patients that we have evaluated for the, of the uh, patients who have underwent Total correction with trans patch with native RBOT. We have not found maybe uh, any case till now who is suitable for melody valve. And since we have no access to the venous valve, so we found that this subset of patient for us as of now is out of bounds for percutaneous spelling valve. The other major constraint, as has been pointed out by everybody before me, the cost. The cost is a major constraint. If you look at the cost of the valve and the cost of the stent, so in our center, it usually costs somewhere around 30 to 35 lakh rupees for a single procedure. Surgery turns out to be much cheaper. And the other is the limitation of hardware. As has been pointed out, you have to have all the things, all the numbers. You have to have three to four stands of all sizes, balloons of all sizes available, which can sometimes become an issue in our labs because we always work hand to mouth kind of a situation in all the cases. So this usually becomes so all these factors will always limit the number of the cases that we do. So the point that I want to highlight is, though it is an attractive option, the indications are evolving, but it, the procedure uh, has a steep learning curve. And the crux to the uh, success is definitely the case selection. You have to evaluate all the cases in detail. Has to be Everything has to be pre-planned because at that, once you are in the lab, you can't look for that this thing is available or not. You have to prepare for every possible complication, every possible hardware has to be available in the lab. Thank you. Thanks, Sushil, for your uh, excellent presentation and the uh, experience that you have gained over the last uh, a couple of years. I think the last case is really an example of how uh, you can, uh, despite having a good operator, whatever hardware that we have, you can get into problems occasionally when you have these homographs or conduits so located that crossing the conduit can sometimes be a problem. Shiva because has of a the, because uh, of the irregularity of the conduit, the yeah, absolutely. calcium you which is present all around you don't know. Let's ask Shiva. He has a very large experience of stenting conduits. How often have you failed to cross a conduit or never? 
failing to cross is not common we we will cross actually i told the, the 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 problem will start right from the beginning sometimes the the guide wire will flip through but even the catheter will not go through so uh, like fr- like it that because it is it is the 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 friction that uh, the specks of calcium are causing to the diagnostic catheters that sometimes even the diagnostic catheter fails to cross so you have to use a little bit more hydrophilic diagnostic catheters my preferred choice is a thermo catheter which is more hydrophilic not the thermo the non braided ones the, ter- the thermo braided ones and then once you are in then the immediate next wire will be an underquist wire the moment you have a landerquist wire then if you have a very smooth slimy bl- balloons of very small diameter like mustang 6 or 8 or 10 they will do the initial job and subsequently you put in a sheet and over the sheet then you take the subsequent balloons like for 14 16 and all i i, i have one question to sushil you yeah. are two cases of bioprosthetic valve while i strongly agree that a coronary integration is mandatory in every conduit i am wondering why it should be the case in a bioprosthetic valve wherein you are putting in within the conduit of course you told that very rarely you might enlarge the conduit 1 or 2 mm by fracturing it but in those cases whatever you have done the 23 mm conduit you are putting in a 22 melody so obviously it is not going to be fracturing the strut at all we are not even going to be trying a larger than 23 for you to fracture so in such a case what is the real need for being so obsessive about uh, coronary the reason why we are so obsessive first of all it's our initial cases so we want to be very sure that there is no coronary compression we also feel that since there is always already a scaffold and the coronary is put ideally be out of that scaffold but when we are dilating them at a very high pressure like in the case of a calcified uh, like valve the calcium can be around as well we didn't do the ct in these patients so if we have done the ct probably the calcium is not outside the thing then obviously the coronaries may not be an issue i think whenever you are for example if you are taking a 23 mm valve and if you are dilating with a 24 atlas or a 25 26 atlas then probably definitely that needs to be done but as long as you are we do that metallic We'd... ring it doesn't uh, matter that's what i feel but i am sure there will be more number of uh, uh, operators who will have uh, uh, you know higher experience i never had a bioprosthetic valve uh, madras medical mission from the beginning has been a homograft center and not a bioprosthetic valve center so we had a very free access for conduits that i we have so many patients with conduits so we hardly get to see a bioprosthetic valve across the pulmonary we system. will see most of the bioprosthetic valve because at our center most of the patients have had a bioprosthetic valve so nowadays we have made it a practice we tell doctor i have to put a 25 26 mm valve so that it doesn't create a problem in future because they will all come back the other point that i wanted to highlight by crossing the rvot we always use a pigtail to cross so that it doesn't cross through the cordy of the tricuspid valve because that's another problem if you cross through the cordy using a wire then taking a sheath or taking a balloon across that can sometimes become difficult the other thing that in this particular case that we failed we found was that the balloon the compliant balloon crossed very easily there was no problem we inflated that as well but what happened during the sheath we tried for at least one one and a half hour we were not able to cross despite whatever we had probably it is a softer sheath as was pointed out we don't have an access to the little stiffer sheath so that could have been one of the issues which i feel i think uh, i think i uh, in the interest of time i think we'll uh, stop the discussion and i'll make one announcement tomorrow we are starting at 4 pm for two reasons one is we have a good number of interesting cases and the second reason is that being a ramadan day many people from bangladesh uh, they have requested that we start uh, a little early so we'll start tomorrow session at 4 pm let me take this opportunity to thank sushil shiva motu and all the participants for having actively participated in this uh, session on percutaneous pulmonary valve in india uh, just one point dr bharat uh, since you almost listed all the centers max delhi neera javasti has also done a couple and narayan hridayalaya dr p v suresh has done two one venous valve and one melody valve yeah because uh, uh, the data i had was not on venus i had only on this things from narayan melody and neeraj avasti i'm sorry i did not have the data 
But if Neeraj has done, I have to uh, apologize to him. Thanks a lot, Dr. Bharat. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. No, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Can I end the meeting, sir? Yeah, please. Thank you, sir.